Thank you so much for joining us today for the Engineering Leadership Series. Today, I have Kimberly Brown, who is Head of Information and Security and Compliance at Colloquy. Yeah, thanks for having me. <laughs> yes, I know. It's so good to see you and chat and hang out. And, um, you know, me and Kimberly have talked about a lot of like fun, random side projects, arts and crafts projects <laughs> together, but I'm so excited to connect on engineering leadership and, you know, your thoughts and ideas around this. So um, talk to me a little bit about just like how you got into management. Yeah, I always thought um, I never wanted to be in management. So I came in a roundabout way a little bit. Uh -huh. People would ask me like, where do you see yourself in five years? You know, where do you want to be? And I'm like, I'm content where I want to be. Um, it wasn't until I had a really good mentor, um, a manager of mine, actually, at one point that sat down with me and said, you know, where do you want to be? What are you looking at? And we went through all the things I was already doing in my role. And she's like, why don't you take the management path? You're already doing all those things. You're already helping people. You're already growing people. And that really seems like the natural path for you. Um, and you've been really good at like building up the team. So it's kind of just a natural progression. I went from just a normal dev and built my way up from team lead, you know, manager and all that stuff. And so. Yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. You didn't feel like you were forced into it? Like, no, not at all. Uh, so didn't feel forced because what we did is we sat down and what came to realization at that point was like, what do you see yourself doing? What do you enjoy about your role? What do you enjoy doing on the role? And one of the things that I naturally came to, and it just kept happening role after role after role is, was helping others on my team or get everybody on the same page and grow them like naturally. So like if we're working on a new project. I grab, I was working on something and someone else had never worked on it before. I kind of said, Hey, do you want to look at this? Do you want to work on this together? Kind of like yeah. showing them something and growing them individually. Yeah. Um, so it wasn't forced because it was something that just like naturally was already happening. It was yeah. just, I never, I didn't see people like me, a female in tech in the middle uh -huh. roles. So I never uh -huh. envisioned that as a thing. Yeah. Was a female in tech. And she's like, no, no, there's definitely a path for you. Let's figure it out. And the even better reason is if you don't see people like you there, we need people like you there. So the next person will see people there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's really interesting. I um, I don't know. Maybe it's because I am a woman in tech. I do see a lot of engineering leadership in tech, but not a lot. But I guess the ones I care about, I'm like, oh, this is you know, it's like, yeah, I know so many of y'all, but uh, I guess I guess I know men too. <laughs> I think, but I think it's changed over the last couple of years. The past yeah. like five six years, I think it's changed a lot. I think I've seen yeah. more women. And I yeah. think naturally, the work that you do, you connect with more. But you, yeah. you see that because of where you where your role takes you. So, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so, you know, I guess, you know, how do you feel like teams should be built? Right. I mean, you kind of naturally found yourself in this position. So you're, you're kind of like naturally building teams all along. Um, mm -hmm. but what do you think is the right way for engineering leaders to approach building teams? Yeah. So building a team, um, I can go two different ways to talk about this. I'll talk mm -hmm. about when I interview first with people and mm -hmm. it'll, you kind of an insight of what I try to build with on teams mm -hmm, to like build mm -hmm. themselves. So interviewing through over time, I've developed two questions that I ask every single person that I interview with. And I'm looking for a couple different things. First question that I ask is what's your biggest oops moment and how do you recover from it? Um, and then I say, you know, I'll give you mine. I don't want to put them on the spot. I don't want them to feel uncomfortable. Um, I tell them my biggest oops moment, it costs the company a lot of money, mm -hmm. um, but I'm still referenceable with that company today. And the biggest thing that I'm looking for is them showing how they recovered from it and what they learned from it and how they grew from it. So like I tell them, Hey, you know, we did this one thing. We missed something in testing. It caused this big issue. And here's how we recover from it. We built up this process. We said no more. No more changing things during go lives. Um, you know, something like a major event. And <laughs> we make sure it goes through the, like an even bigger process than it, especially during go lives um, and hyper active time that, you know, it, we guarantee nothing's going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said, I recovered from that. That company's referenced today. 
they've tried to get me to come work for them before. So it's like one of those things, like people make mistakes, we're all human. Um, so the biggest thing I look for on there is that they actually just know that it's okay to make mistakes. We all do it. We're all human. Mm-hmm. And the biggest thing is that you've learned from your mistake. Mm-hmm. Second question I ask is usually like, what's your favorite programming language? And I really don't care the answer on that one. I don't, you could say any language in the world. What I'm looking for in there is like the enthusiasm that you have. So if you have enthusiasm for even a, one of the languages, I know that like you're excited to build. You're excited in your role. This is something that you really are passionate about. Um, yeah. I always answer that one, pseudocode. It's, you know, the basis of any language. And the reason why I do it is because I like breaking down puzzles, taking each piece, put them together, see the bigger picture. But I've heard all sorts of crazy answers on there. Um, yeah. So that's building a team there. I want to see that you're creative. I want to see that like you can admit that you're human and you make mistakes. That's like the biggest thing. If you're not willing to do that, you're usually not a good part of a team and it's a yeah. team. Yeah. And then yeah. the second part of the team is just trying to figure out like what your, your goals are, not necessarily the company goals, not necessarily where like, you know, the path that the company takes you, but what's your goals in what you want to do. And that helps figure out who can be where on the team, what kind of hand they help in the team. And yeah. that kind of helps mesh everybody. Cause you, someone you'd be surprised like, oh, I want to become a manager one day, but they never speak up. So like putting them in places where they speak up more or, hey, I just want to stay a developer, but they've been the ones helping others. Cool, we can shift that as well. So. Yeah, yeah. I love that. Like you're focusing more on like, um it's like you really try to understand individuals and you put the focus on individuals and then put the team together that way versus like, Hey, we have this goal and you need to fit into this mold. And if you don't fit into this mold, then you're not doing your job. Mm -hmm. It's more like, it's more of like a fluid, I feel like approach in my opinion to, to building a team. Yeah. And if that doesn't mean that you're not going to give them work that they don't want to do, that doesn't mean that they're not going to be doing something they do. We all have that in parts of life, right? We get projects that we're like, oh, this is the worst. I never want to do this, but you know, yeah. we have to do this to get to the next phase. Yeah. It just yeah. means that in your different seasons of times, cause we all have, you know, the curves that go up and down where like I'm passionate right now, or I have something else going on. And like, I really don't want to do something right now because of X, Y, Z going on in my life. Um, it helps kind of keep that mental load balanced for yeah. you as well. Yeah. Well, I mean, what do you think is the benefit of, uh, you know, like approaching teams like this? Yeah. Um, one, they get more hands-on in different areas that you never in. I've seen a lot of companies where people get signed a role and they get really good at something and then they just do the same thing over and over and over and over, mm-hmm. right? Because they're really good at it or they've always done it. Um, and they can do it quickly. However, in that aspect too, if you think about it, you know, they always say like, what if that person got hit by a bus tomorrow? Never yeah. want that to happen, but like, right. No one else knows it. So it shares the knowledge across the team. It also keeps their brain functioning in a different way. So it keeps you busy, right? Like uh, you see different things or do different things. So something that you code, you might get comfortable with. You code it a thousand times. You're like, Oh, I'm going to do it this way. You can do it this way. Now you're working on a different project and you realize, oh man, I actually can improve this or I can make mm-hmm. this better or I can make my old code better. It actually, I feel, ignites a little more. They get more excited about it. They get more excited about helping each other. They get more excited about learning new things or showing things. I've seen where like on teams where we've had team leads always do all the work, always do all the work and then say, oh, you have to do it this way, junior devs. Well, just because they're a junior dev doesn't mean they don't have the same ideas. I've had where I've switched it up a little and junior devs have taken like a proof of concept project and built something well above and beyond that the senior devs he's like I would have never thought of it that way so it Mm -hmm. gives like more excitement on the team right it builds trust between people because once they see something's accomplished in a different way from somebody else they're like oh they actually do instead of like creating these like tunnels yeah it's like you're in your lane I'm in my lane and you know you're you're doing a good job or not doing a good job. But once you see people kind of like open up and blossom, you're like, oh, you all of a sudden like have, it's almost like building more respect on teams, mm-hmm. you know, within within the different team team members and things like that. Yeah. I like that. It also, like makes, that. it also makes work less hard for people because 
I have found when that trust and that respect gets built, um, they actually end up working faster and uh -huh. more efficiently because they're not sitting together and just saying, I need to accomplish this one task that was given to me. They actually collaborate more a lot where yeah. they're like, I need to finish this task, but I can't think of it. And they actually reach out to others on the teams, especially with the remote world today. Like yeah. it's not as easy to just like talk to your coworker that's next to you or a lot of depth conversations. You actually have to like hit a button and say, Hey, could you have a minute to talk kind of thing? Right. So, right. I I've seen it from that way as well. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, what else from like a, like a team building perspective, I, I would say like, if you, you know, I, you talked previously about like, um, you know, I guess bad managers. <laughs> and so like from all the bad managers you've had, like what are some of the other best practices you've learned from an engineering leadership perspective that um, have, you know, made you who you are today? Yeah, your biggest teachers, I think, are usually the people that treat you the worst because you're like, I'm never going to do that. Or, but then you, then you value the people that treated you as an equal or the best, right? Because then you're saying they really were encouraging me when maybe you like didn't see eye to eye because you're like frustrated, right? Um, some of the best things I've learned from bad managers or good managers is like literally listen, just sit and listen. Like people just want to be heard and they want to like have a common goal to work with toward with towards with you. And if you're just like kind of spitballing to them, always do this, do this, do this, do this. Um, it doesn't really work. I always ask the question why, and a lot of people think I'm challenging them and I give them the proof. I'm not challenging you. I really want to see your point of view, but like, why did you do it this way? I'm not saying your way is wrong. Just why? Cause if you, you need to be able to explain it, right? Like if you can't explain it to get the whole group in on it, it's going to be a little more difficult to get your idea moving. Um, yeah. I've also learned over time. I hated English in all of school. I went into tech because I was like, I won't have to do as much English. That's a lie. You have just as many papers to write, just as many, you know, things you have Especially to write. Especially in leadership. Yeah. So <laughs> but one of the things I've learned over time is like the who, the what, the why, the where, the when, like that you uh -huh. learned in like elementary school is relevant in everything you do. Why are you doing it? Who are you doing it for? What's the reason for it? Where is it going to be applied? How is it going to be used? Like all those things are truly, truly relevant. So when anybody comes up with a new idea or a new plan or a new procedure or process, I ask them those five questions. It's the like, hey, can you answer all these questions about the thing you're trying to accomplish? Because in English, you should be able to answer anything. That, no, obviously like we, I work with teams that are internationally and their languages are a little different, but like the basis here. Um, and I felt found that helps a lot for gaining people to get on a level of ground and understanding as well. So. Yeah, I love that. Well, I'm enjoying this conversation. I wanted to give a brief uh, word from our sponsor, This Thought, which is my company, and thank my team for always letting me talk to fun people like you. <laughs> Um, we're a development consultancy team of about 50 people, 100% remote worldwide. So when you talk about remote stuff, I'm like, yes, it's like my entire life. Um, we specialize in app development and upgrading legacy systems. So we get to work with some pretty cool people, uh, Roblox, PlayStation, Twilio, Capital One, PayPal, et cetera. Um, but yeah, if you need help with legacy systems and challenges you're facing or you need to modernize, uh, definitely check us out. You can find us at this.co. That's T-H-I-S-D-O-T.co. Um, so Kimberly, what are like some of the... Uh, I guess, you know, like if you're an individual contributor on a team and you're trying to succeed in life, whatever that may mean for you as an individual, like how do you, how do you work with leadership on that? Like, how do you, how do you get to where you need to be as an IC? I think especially in larger organizations, right? Like it's difficult to navigate and it's, it's easy to just kind of feel like, you know, a cog. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're just like, I'm just there. Here I am. And not everybody is, you know, as privileged to like have, you know, mentorship and, and kind of like a leader like you that cares about people individually. Yeah. So there's a couple aspects to that. So mm -hmm. I've been 
that cog in the machine at some points. I've worked for really, really large companies where I feel like I'm just a number and like nobody knows who I am. And I've also worked on really small startups where like everybody knows who I am because we're so small. There's so many little people. Um, And you made a good point when you said, you know, how do you get suggestion for success? And you immediately said after what that means to you, right? That's the biggest thing is focus on what success means to you and then communicate that. Um, and it might not be that you can communicate it within your company. You should be communicating to your manager. If your manager is not listening, that's a whole different story, different conversation that you probably need to have with yourself and your manager. Um, because maybe that just means that that place is not for you if you're not getting help in that aspect. But I found the biggest help in it is um, reaching out to your network. You'd be surprised, right? Like, Tracy, me and you connected via email through a network that we're in of yeah. executive women, right? And I reached out, you reached out to me, I think, first, and we mm-hmm. just chatted and kept chatting. But like reaching out to your network or friends of friends, and like, hey, this is what success means for me. Here's where I want to go. And finding like, oh, I know this person that knows this person that could give me some advice. Um, if you just don't ask for help, it's yeah. going to be a lot difficult but asking for help and asking people around you or even if you see somebody like I've randomly reached out to people on LinkedIn because I'm like I like what you're doing I like what you're posting um here's something that I'm passionate about how do I like move this forward I feel like you'd be a good person you'd be surprised how many people will reach back and say hey I'll take a phone call or hey let's do a video chat or hey let's go get brunch and let's just chat about it so being your own advocate and speaking up, I think is yeah. the biggest step you can take, but also sitting down with yourself and like writing down your goals. I think when my career really took off is I sat down with myself and I made a list of like five or six goals, which I had never done in my life before. I've never written them down. I've never like made like one line sentences for goals. And weirdly enough, like I completed all of them with like in a year. Yeah. Just for like, isn't that weird how that happens? Yeah. Yeah, I do that too. Like, I'll be like, okay, what's my goal in one year, two years, four years, whatever. And then, you know, four years later, I look back, I'm like, well, I accomplished it, but I'm ready for more goals. You know, but like, it's crazy. Cause you know, four years ago, right? Like you think, oh, this is a, this is a, str- you know, this is a stretch goal, or this is like something I'm really trying hard at. And then you like, set your set yourself on the path for success. Um, yeah, my goals I said for three years and I completed yeah. them in one year. And it was yeah. just because I, it was part of it was during pandemic. I got so hyper focused on it. And yeah. Like, what else am I going to do? Right. So, um, yeah. But I complete them all things. So that's the biggest thing is being your self advocate and like don't be afraid to reach out to people. One of the things is like, what's the worst they can say? No. And if they yeah. say no, that's fine. They well, set their boundary. But as a person who has done this, time and time again, I will say that like, you know, the, um, the CEO, for example, um, Tom Kalinske, who was the CEO of Sega when the, you know, the Nintendo Sega Wars were going on, mm-hmm. I was yeah. just like, man, I'd really love to talk to him. And, you know, most people would be like, oh, this person's so busy, whatever. Right. But I mean, he was, he, we just hung out, you know, and yeah. it's like, <laughs> I think, most of most of people who you think are busy are actually not that busy because everybody thinks they're busy. So I mean, yeah, yeah I might be busy, but a lot of people aren't busy because everybody's scared to reach out to them. So you'd be surprised how many people you meet. But I think the other point you bring up is, um, you know, your journey, whether it be in, you know, in, in your, in, at, at work or externally outside of work, individually, your individual goals, Um, You don't need to look inside work if you're not getting what you, Mm -hmm. if you're not getting what you, um, what you need, right? So finding somebody externally can help you at work or maybe empower you to go somewhere else, generally speaking, but you might not be able to find that like within the confines of your organization. Yeah. And that's, I mean, and like I've moved companies a couple of times and some of it has been where I like plateaued. They didn't have a role that I was interested in next. Wasn't that I didn't enjoy the company. Wasn't it that I enjoyed my coworkers. It was just, I needed to take the next step. And the only way for me to take the next step is to move on. Yeah. And like, I 
not that I ever want anybody, like I'm trying to grow people that work for me and I want them to grow and succeed. But if they ever feel like they have to go somewhere else to right. grow themselves, like I encourage that. Like I really, yeah. you know, I'm, I'll, I'll say I'm selfish. I wish you wouldn't leave. And I, you know, we'll work with you. We'll try to figure things out, but that's not always possible. Right. And just yeah. being like understanding of that and saying yeah. things. Um, one of the things that I tell people that I manage, when we have one of our first conversations as well is like, I know I'm doing my job. Well, if you can take my job from me, yeah, so if you get, yes, if yeah. that's what your goal is. And that's where you want to be. If you can do my job, I'm okay with that. If you want to come for my job, go ahead and do that because that means I'm doing my job right. And that means yeah. I'm empowering you to look for more. And that means that you're going to, you know, you Kimball are, are going to get promoted because you found somebody to take your job. I say that a lot when it comes to like, you know, engineers, like you, you know, you and I, I don't, we talked about this, like hit by a bus situation, right? But it's like, you're not the, you know, if you're the one that only knows a specific thing, you, you know, that's not job security. That means that you're stuck. But if mm -hmm. you can empower everybody else to know how to do your job and you become like not needed anymore in that specific position that gives you the opportunity to grow into the next position that, you know, is probably a promotion or a raise or something like that. So yeah, exactly a different way of looking at things. Yeah. I love that too. I still remember my first job, um, in corporate and, um, I, you know, they assign you mentors. And so I was assigned this <laughs> mentor and she was like, um, you know, a VP of engineering. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, I was, uh, <laughs> I was all over the place at the time, but I could tell like the second she realized she could not help me and the mm -hmm. tone changed and she didn't want to meet with me anymore. See, and but then like, she should have admitted that she should have said, I can't help you anymore yeah. versus like blowing you off. <laughs> so she didn't like blow me off. Like, you know what I'm saying? But like, you know, it was like, a I could, I could feel the, the, the like little push to the side in a sense. And mm -hmm. I was like, oh, okay, whatever. I honestly, I didn't really care. Um, <laughs> I knew, you know, you, so yeah. I think when you feel that too, right? Like you can outgrow your mentors too. I think that's a, that's a really Yeah. I mean, I've had many that like were assigned to me, but like you could tell they were assigned to me and they didn't really want to help. But then I have others yeah. who weren't assigned to me or like took their place or people who just like naturally helped. Yeah. Like, yeah. You just, uh, one of the, I have, young children. And one of the things that we always tell them is like, look for the helpers. If you're ever in a stuck situation, look for the helpers. Yeah. Um, and that just like applies to everything in life, not like coding, not like mentoring or like you're just in a struggle, look for the helpers. And I think it's relevant for like adults is it look for the helpers, look for the people that want to help, that are willing to help, looking for help. Not saying that everybody else is like irrelevant, but like if you're stuck, you usually yeah. can get yourself out of that rut by trying to do something like that. Yeah. I love that. Okay. So where do we find you on the internet? If we want to find out more, uh, talk to you. Slide yeah. The biggest you. one is LinkedIn. I don't really have, I have not embraced like Instagram or like Facebook or any of that, like professionally at all. Um, yeah. I kind of keep that like personally because I have yeah. young children. Yeah. Uh, but LinkedIn it's whatever the LinkedIn slash, I think it's slash users slash Kimberly LC Brown. But. Okay. I think it's slash in slash Kimberly. I can't remember. I always forget what the yeah. slash whatever is. I know. Yeah. I feel you. I feel you. But yeah, Kimberly Brown um, at Colloquy. And, um, you know, thank you so much again for hanging out with us for a second on this. And uh, thanks everyone for listening. We'll see you next time. Yeah. Thank you for having me. This is great. This is fun.